Impact Lounge is the number one YouTube channel for fans of Impact Wrestling. Make, make a, make a, uh, a good, good lucha, lucha thing. That is just a fact of life. Hello, welcome back to the Impact Lounge Impact Review. I'm your host, Adam, and as always, I'm joined by Ro. How are you today, Ro? I'm great, Adam, and yourself? Yeah, feeling on top of the world and uh, really enjoyed this week's show again. So uh, really looking forward to diving in, having a look at uh, what's been going on on the actual show, get your views on it, because un unusual for us, we usually talk about how we felt about it, and we haven't done it this week before we started recording. So it'll be really interesting to see what, you, what your take is on it as well. But before that, as always, we, we usually have a trivia question and we dive into the listeners' questions as well. So on that note, if you have got a question for us, uh, over you know since last week and you want to get our views on it make sure you leave some comments on the comments section on the youtube video now i know some of you listen on podbean and through iMusic apple music whatever it's called as well but uh, yeah we do tend to answer our questions for the ones that are posed to us on either youtube or on twitter so uh, i'm going to read out our twitter handles in a second but please do give us a follow especially if you want to get some uh, photos from the impact tapings when they hit the uk in september i'm going to be there and uh, you might see some backstage footage as well if i get allowed backstage so yeah my twitter handle is at v2 that's the letter and the number wrestling show and Rose is over to you, bro. RT great underscore. Once again, that's RT great underscore. So if you're listening to the show, you like what we do, and you want to see all the latest impact news and views, uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. Uh, so just go along, hit that subscribe button, whether it's on, as I said, Podbean, Apple Music, or YouTube. Uh, we're trying to get our viewers up to, our listenership up to 4,000 on YouTube. So it's really important to us that you do uh, hit the subscribe and either give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Right, so let's get into the trivia question first of all. Last week, Ro posed you a question, and as he said, he thought it was an easy one. So uh, let, let's have the answer. <laughs> I, I'm not going to even say who was the first because I think everyone just got it right, but it was Abyss. And obviously, I think what gave it away was the match that he innovated that he's lost more than he's actually won, which is the Monsters Ball. But, you know, the one thing that stuck out, I don't know if too many people caught this, but him winning the world title off of disqualification had to be one of the most random world title wins especially when you're talking about in a dq and then he, you know he did it against sting so i just really always thought that was one of the crazy moments of then tna i don't actually remember that um so, so what was the background to that row that match um i don't remember the particulars but you know they had uh, they had the stipulation that the belt could change on a disqualification normally in wrestling when you get those you know usually the belt doesn't change hands but it was one of the rare few occurrences where uh, I forgot what Sting did to get disqualified, but the title changed hands. I think the most recent one to happen in another company, uh, Christian actually won too, where uh, I believe uh, Randy Orton had low blowed Christian. So Randy Orton got disqualified and then Christian was awarded the world championship. It's, you know, it's obviously a weird way to win uh, any, any championship, but nevertheless abyss is one of the rare few to hold that feat well there you go well done to all those who got it right so this week is going to be one of my questions uh a bit com convoluted this one so you have to pay attention to what i'm actually asking it's two answers i want on this okay so we've recently seen rebel back on our tv screens and uh, Ro obviously Ro and i talked about her last week but what i want to know is when she debuted with then tna uh, what was the name of her stable and who was the wrestler who played um, the guy under the mask? So there was one guy who wore a mask. I just want to know the name of that wrestler and the stable that Rebel debuted with. Do you know the answer, Ro? Yes, I do. Oh, well, must have been an easy one then. Anyway, leave your answers in the comments below. And uh, yeah, we'll read out uh, the quickest next week. All right, over to the questions then. So what did we get this week, Ro? Okay, this one is from Stephen Ewan. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. But his question was, with the signing of Rich Swan to a long-term deal, as well as with Eli Drake, Tessa, and Abyss, 
do we think that Impact is locking in talents that they see in the foreseeable future that are going to be a part of the future? And who are some people that we'd like to see sign next? Um, I think as far as Abyss's case, I think he signed more. He's going to be more of a backstage talent. I think, you know, they'll use him here and there. But, you know, I, I think it's good. I had most recently seen... Jim Ross, when he was discussing Slammiversary, and, you know, he was praising it, and he was saying the one thing he would like Impact to do is develop kind of like a, a core six, six or seven people that they can build around, and I think that is something that Impact needs to do, where they have six or seven guys that are the main guys, so, you know, these are guys that we're going to always see on the shows and build around them, and then, you know, you can always mix and match, plug in, you know, plug in and out wrestlers. But I, I think that's important. As far as who I would like to see them sign next, um, there's really nobody that comes to mind at this moment in time. I think the roster that they got is more than enough. I mean, if anything, I think if they're, you know, one, I don't even want to say criticism, but one fault that they have is it's hard to get everybody at these tapings sometimes. You know, there's times where we go weeks where we don't see one particular wrestler. And that's kind of like why I, I wish with Explosion they changed the format and maybe had – an, an additional match versus having just one match and everything else they have. So, yeah, to answer your question, um, I have no problem with them locking down the long-term uh, deals for those wrestlers mentioned, um, as long as they're going to be uh, uh, as long as they're going to be the focal points, I should say. Well, for me, uh, it, it would be some of those tag teams, and specifically either LAX or OVE with Sammy Callahan. I think uh, all of these guys. You know, I have a long future in the business, and I've talked and waxed lyrical about uh, obviously Santana for quite some time. What was uh, disturbing on this week's teleconference we had at uh, LAX, and um, it did seem to me that they, they were hinting that there isn't many people left for them to face in Impact. So uh, maybe the answer should be, well, let's sign someone outside of Impact, uh, you know, in the tag team division. But, um, you know, I've always been a big fan of Santana, but this week, Ortiz as well, um, both on the show and, and, and on the teleconference, he came over as a different character, someone who, you know, Ro and I have always talked about there's, there's always a Giannetti in the team when they split and, and we've hinted it might be Ortiz. But do you know what? He's growing on me. Week by week, he's growing on me. And I think that possibly he could be uh, a single star as well. I'm certainly looking forward to that feud when it finally happens. And it is going to happen, isn't it, Ro? Yeah, I think it's inevitable, the split. I mean, we've seen this in history. Even when you think about um, under the TNA umbrella, you know, I think of the Wolves that come to mind. Um, you know, during their time when they were at their height, in TNA being a uh, multiple time tag team champions. I remember when I started wa uh, watching after, you know, the whole uh, Destination America move, when I finally got a chance to catch them, they had already had the belts like in their third reign. And we already see with LAX, you know, this iteration of LAX where they're already in their third title reign. So, you know, they're coming to the point where they've done everything they could as a team. And you hate to see great tag teams break up, but sometimes, you know, you got to do what you got to do and, you know, see what could happen. I think it'd be awesome if you could have both both guys become stars. But, you know, like you say, you know, you're going to have somebody has to be the Janetti. So it'd be interesting. Can you think of any tag teams that, that never did split? I, I'm trying to wreck my brains at the moment uh, over history. Has there been a tag team that were always a tag team but never had a solo career? I, I can't think of any that spring to mind. Yeah, they always do. And you know what? What we've seen and, you know, the one that comes to mind of the split and I want to say, you know, I think both guys ended up becoming successful, albeit one had to leave and, you know, find an opportunity elsewhere is uh, Edge and Christian. You know, mm. you think about with Edge, you know, I, I kind of felt like he probably fell into his role just because during that time, you know, I, I forgot what was going on during that era. But then, you know, you think when Christian came on board to TNA, you know, they really made him a star. But normally when we see tag teams break up under the same, within the same company, you know, one achieves a high success where the other partner, you know, whether it's stuck in the mid card or end up forming a tag team with someone else. So, yeah, I can't think of any tag teams that were able to stay together throughout their whole tenure of their wrestling career. I'm just thinking back to that Edge time. I think that was when uh, the whole Matt Hardy storyline came about with Lita as well. I think that was 
shortly into it, into his singles career. It might have been a few years, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think that was that was around the same time. But anyway, um, yeah, just thinking back to Edge and Christie, because obviously you had the Hardys and you had uh, the Dudleys as well, and all of those have had singles careers at some point. So it's very hard to think of anyone who uh, who, who stayed together the whole time. The Bushwhackers, there you go. That's the only one I can think of. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so thanks for that question. And uh, I think that will do it for this week, unless there was a, another one that jumped out. I think some of the other ones that we did have were things like, you know, do we uh, – actually, oh, we'll go for it. Uh, the Eddie Edwards, do we think he'll get another title reign? So, um, obviously, he's got the match next week for the title. Do you think uh, they'll give him another title reign? I don't think anytime soon. I think he'd probably be more of somebody if there was a situation where – you know, heaven forbid somebody were to get injured and they needed to take the belt off of someone. I think that's he would be if. OK, just to sum it all up in in the short words, I think if he gets the belt again, he'll be more of a transitional champion. I don't think he, he'd he be somebody that they'd invest, you know, months into, you know, being as far as the world championship. I think X Division or tag. Yeah, I think he can win those again. But as far as world, if they put the belt on him, if they were to put the belt on him, it'd be for, you know, to put it on someone else. So using him as a transitional champion. Yeah, I think it was probably right that if they do give to me a transitional. Um, the other problem is that if he, they don't put it on him, where does he go with the character? I suppose you could have someone costing him the title, in which case that could spring to a feud. But you just feel that uh, he needs something like this. And and. The other thing that we talked about, and I think it was Colby Cooper who asked the question, mentioned, do you think that if they did put it on him, it would go full circle with Sammy Callahan then going after it, which would make sense. But I think it's too soon to do that now. I think you've, you know, we've only just finished that feud, really. I know it's been more Tommy Dreamer recently, but I still think that it's too soon to go back to the Sammy Callahan well. Um, but so you'd have to have another contender before he, I think he went down the Sammy Callahan route. And then you've got the problem as well, that if Sammy Callahan does challenge Eddie Edwards for it, who wins that feud? I mean, can you see either of them being the, you know, the, the face of impact? Uh, I'm not sure if I can. What would you, what do you think? If that's the route that they go, what, where, where do you think that would go? Do you think they put it on Callahan? I mean, I think if they were going to do that, I, I I look at it like this and not to kind of get away and try to fantasy book. I could, I would have seen that more if say Moose was champion. Like you have to have some super baby face be the champion. Cause I think if you're going to put the belt on Callahan, just with the heat that he's able to draw it, it would uh, work wonders if it was, you know, if he were to beat a super baby face, you know, could you imagine, you know, if it was Johnny impact or, you know, like I said, Moose. So, you know, it, it, it's it's weird. Like, I honestly, you know, and I find myself just watching. I said, you know, I've kind of come to grips with the fact that, hey, this is how it is. These are the titles that we have. But I feel like, you know, maybe down the road, their hands are going to be forced and they're going to have to bring a mid-card championship because, you know, you got some of these guys working the upper uh, um, main event card. And, you know, obviously not everyone's going to challenge for the world championship. And, even though they can expand the X division, you know, there's some guys that you could probably get away with, but not everyone's going to be able to work that type of style. So obviously if you're able to introduce some sort of TV title, you know, it gives the guys that can't compete for the world championship, something to compete for. So, you know, th I think the one thing I'd like to see them, my la last bit on it is the one thing I'd like to see them do, excuse me, only because they don't do it too much. And I don't think it hurts. You know, they need to start running some uh, multi-man, you know, maybe world championship matches, you know, get guys in, even though they might not necessarily be a uh, favorite to win the match, but I just think it goes a long way. So if they had some, you know, eight pack challenge and, you know, you throw in an Eddie Edwards, you throw in a Sammy Callahan, Moose and all the other, these other uh, top guys, I think it could do, go a long way in, in developing contenders. It also um, protects your champion if you want to take the belt off him. Yes. You know, uh, having him not actually lose the title because then you get a ready-made storyline for the rematch. But anyway, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. That was Colby Cooper, who I know listens to the show each week. Thanks for tuning in and uh, thanks for leaving us as a comment. And if any new listener is listening and wants to leave us a comment or a question for next week, please do so in the comment section along with your answer to the trivia question. So uh, that's it for the preamble. Let's get into the main show, shall we? Uh, I didn't ask you this before we start tonight, but what was what did you think of the show overall before we dive into the segments? 
I liked it. It seems like they're really finding their groove, like the way that they're laying out these shows and just as far as their matches and certain segments and how they're able to with certain individuals who might not be on the card physically, you know, having whether it's a backstage segment or some uh, uh, video vignette, you know, to kind of just keep things relevant. I, I've I've uh, greatly appreciated everything. So, yeah. I liked it. Solid show. Pretty much the same views as me. Right. One thing I did notice, actually, was that they changed the opening credits this week. Um, they've got new clips in there. And the reason why it stood out is because uh, you said a few weeks ago that you really liked the cutter that I think it was Jake Chris. Was it Jake or was it the other one? Uh, Dave. Jake did through the table and you, and you commented about how well he timed that. And, and the reason why that stuck in my mind, because I didn't disagree with you at the time, was that whenever I saw that clip, it made me cringe a little bit because I thought he mistimed it. <laughs> and it was there it, it was there in the opening credits each week, but this week it's it's now gone. You've got uh, new clips in there, which is, which is good that they freshen it up. But um, one of the things that I noticed in the title sequence, which they, they keep highlighting, is the owl, the anthem owl. And uh, I know some people don't like it, like Rebby Hardy. She doesn't like it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I do like it. I, I like the, the fact that they, they're sticking with their themes, you know. So good good stuff. And, and the opening video recap of last week was, was excellent. Every week they do these. And I think, you know, it's, it's a distinctive way of opening the show. Uh, but it works. You know, you don't see that on uh, WWE, do you? It, so it's a good way of just reminding viewers to uh, what happened last week and, and setting up this week's show. So if you ever missed one, it's great. You know, you know what's happened. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, because you know what, you you know, you look at it. I know we all watch Impact. Sometimes we're able to watch it when it airs. Some of us have to wait the next day, or you know, whatever, whenever we can fit it in our uh, schedule. And sometimes there might be instances where you don't get to see the full thing. So to be able to kind of get a quick recap, I, I think that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking of not being able to watch it first time, you know, we we did talk about this before we start tonight, but unfortunately, the ratings for this show were terrible this week and and sometimes it just doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason and you know we could make excuses those kind of things it doesn't bother me and you said pretty much the same but you said that there was um, a hall of fame football match on or something yeah you know and like i said i always post on twitter and you know to people who follow me you know i'm not posting it to shame or you know overreact it's just you know just to share because what i just find interesting is just it, there's no consistency with him and you know like you say you know that you can make ex excuses and like i said I, I i realize like a lot of people you know we, they watch it in different formats so not everyone's watching it as it airs you know whether you watch it you know later you know via dvr or online so those aren't factored in but i guess what just always is fascinating to me is like there's not that average number that they're able to kind of hover around like you might get one week where it's 299 and then the next week is 265 like that's a big drop you know i i had figured i was i, I had always figured that you know around the 300k you know from 295 to 300k they hover around there that's their core audience obviously you want to build off of that but that's your building block but we see you know week in and week out like they range so i'm interested to see next week what they do because if it's a if it if it decreases even more then you know i i could see where management like how management was concerned a, a couple weeks ago about the ratings but i mean if they're back to you know 280 or 290 then you know you could say all right well it was just that one down week because of football but yeah it's just the inconsistency that uh, gets me it's a shame as well because in the uk we, we have a lot of uh scheduling issues with, with regards to impact i mean it debuted on five spike i don't know over a year ago now and we, they've shifted it around the schedule something rotten you know it started off at nine o'clock on a friday then it went to 10 then it went to 11 then it went to 10 past 11 it, it was bizarre so a couple of weeks ago they announced that the fight uk a network or whatever it was had, had launched a channel and it was going to be airing live every week so that was like oh fantastic news you know we're going to get it at the same time as the us uh, and that lasted one week before they announced that five spike had uh, had uh, what was it, what was it, interfered and said no you're, you're breaching your you know your deal with us so now it's back to random times on spike again and, and it's you know the scheduling has been terrible the uk it's it's a real shame because you know they've got a real core following over here um most probably bigger than 
the US this week. So uh, let, let's hope they uh, that they get that sorted. But yeah, to me, it doesn't make that difference because I just enjoy watching the show. I don't care if one person watches it or, or a million. But obviously, you want them to do well and have a revenue so that they can carry on putting on these shows. So it, it, it does make a difference to them. But to, to me, it doesn't alter the product that they're doing on the screen. Anyway, uh, so we had the video recap. Very, very good. And then we started off with a match of Sue Young and an undead bridesmaid versus Kira Hogan and Ali. Um, I'll give my thoughts on the second, but what did, what did you make of this one? You know, it's fine. Um, I will say, I mean, I guess it's obvious that we're going to get Ali and Sue Young part two. But I just feel like they're going backwards because, you know, you think about, you know, you know, essentially that that uh, Sue Young actually had won the championship from Ali. Then we've seen Ali feud with Tessa. Then, you know, now she's going back to Sue Young. So, you know, it just kind of seems strange. But then, it, uh, you know, we see post match where, you know, Tessa's involvement. So that might not be done. So maybe we can be possibly getting a triple threat. And it's always a pleasure to see Kara Hogan. Obviously, you know, she's still. I don't want to say she's green, but, you know, she's still getting better at owning her craft. You know, she's somebody that should be an explosion regular for the time being. She needs to be on TV more if she's going to be part of the future. And then um, I was trying to figure out the whole part of this match, who the undead bride was. I want to say it was Casey Spinelli, but, you know, she either she played it off differently this go around or it was someone totally different. But, you know, fine. You know, just a setup I, where I'm guessing – a feud between uh, Ali and Sue Young. So, the the comment I want to make about this match is, is first of all, we got Sting versus Hogan at one point, which is quite good. <laughs> it really did look like uh, the Crow Sting, didn't it, against uh, Hogan in, in in the the match? But um, was the wrestling ability of these four ladies, and it was very poor. And, and I know I go on about Ali all the time being not a very good wrestler or, or not showing it in these matches. But the best wrestler in this match was the undead bridesmaid, Casey Spinelli. She was the only one that looked like she knew what she was doing at times. And it, it was it was terrible, the wrestling, I thought. There was a jump that Ali did from the turnbuckle onto the undead bridesmaid. Even that looked hopeless by Ali. I, I don't know what's going on with that woman. And I know she's super over and she's lovely in real life. But, oh, my word, she sucks in the ring. She really sucks in the ring for, for you know, a 10-year-plus veteran. I'm, I'm sorry because, you know, we're obviously very all about pro and positivity and impact. And, you know, I like what the storyline's going. I like Ali. But I, I just – I don't get why people say she's a good wrestler, you know, uh, and they wish that she could break out the moves that she did as um, – is it Pepper Potts or Cherry Bomb? I can't remember which one it is. Um, I, I, I hope she shows something soon because I'm getting fed up of watching a match and know it's, it's going to be terrible. Even the DDT hammerlock that she sold, she, she, no, she didn't no sell it, but it doesn't look like she can take the move. Whereas Kira Hoga, when she took it, she took it like a boss, you know, and it's, it's beginning to really frustrate me now. Every time I see Ali in the ring, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, she's over, but she's not very good. You know what? When you pointed that out, now that you mentioned it, sorry about that. Um, when Tessa gave the DDT, I didn't know if she w it was meant for her to kind of like be like aggressive where like we've seen sometimes with moves where someone just like grabs somebody with force and delivers a move or Ali wasn't positioned right. Like maybe she had sandbagged it. And I don't think that was the case. But yeah, I, I looked at that and I had thought about what you, you know, you had mentioned in the past where like she doesn't know how to take the move. And um, I was like, dang, you know, that's what Adam pointed out. The only thing I, I, the only, I'm not going to say cr criticism, but the only thing that stood out to me was I noticed with her, when she does the super kick, it's like she's delivering it to them in their chest. Like it doesn't <laughs> even look like it's anywhere near the face. And, I noticed know, that as well. And, and, you know, I don't know if that's the person who's taking it or whatever. So I think that's just what seems kind of odd. So I think maybe that's why they have her going with the code breaker. But, I mean, I don't have too much of a problem with her, but I, I've seen the criticism where a lot of people have uh, critiqued um, her in the ring. So, I mean, there's times it, you know, she could be better, but, I mean, it is what it is. 
Just on the super kick one, you're right. I, I noticed that as well. But I think I've only ever seen her catch someone and make it look good once. And that was when she won the championship against Laurel Van Ness, who once again, you know, people used to criticize her wrestling. But I think it's it's head and heels above Ali's. But yeah, that, that was a great finish to the match when she delivered the super kick there. Another thing is when you're watching an Ali match, you know that the commentary team at some point are going to have to say, oh, she didn't catch hold of that one. <laughs> because she, she always messes up something. But the one thing I will say is Sue Young did really well in selling the code breaker. Did really, really well. Oh, oh yeah. And I, I like, you know, the thing that I loved was Sue Young did. I believe she did. Yeah, she was able to pull it off on uh, Kira originally. But that panic switch, that's a cool finishing move just from the spin and then how she's able to, to land it. I, I like that. And I think that fits her character. The only thing I didn't like about the match, other than everything I've mentioned, <laughs> which is pre- which is pretty much the whole match, um, was that from a booking point of view, I don't understand why the Undead Bridesmaid didn't take the pin on this one. Uh, but there you go. Um, I thought that the Undead Bridesmaid, uh, Casey Spinelli, deserves a bit more than she's getting at the moment. But anyway, it was what it was. And Tessa then cuts a promo backstage. I love Tessa. I think she's brilliant. I really do. Everything she does looks great. And she sounds great and i don't know she's i don't know a bit muscly for some people those kind of things but there's something there's something sexy about her we talked about scarlet bordeaux last week of being unsexy whilst being this you know an overly sexual character there's something sexy about tessa in my opinion but there you go i just think you know what it's just a matter of time um obviously it, i think they're going to take their time when they do it but eventually when she wins the knockouts championship she might be one of these people that we see with a long uh, title reign just because everything she does i mean it's just you know from you know she's when she's on the camera how she delivers her promos her ring work just everything that's what you want in a champion so um, it's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out because I obviously it looks like we're probably gonna get Ali Sue Young I guess you could say part three but with Tessa being a roadblock I can easily see them doing some sort of triple threat which you know ad- adds an interesting layer to the whole equation yeah absolutely um okay so what do we move on to next I believe it was the ogs next wasn't it um against Two guys who I will never see again, Nathan Stokes and Ray Steele. Now, before I get your thoughts on this, I don't mean to rag on on the wrestling ability of people. And these guys, obviously, you know, have not been on national TV before. But there was a couple of moments in this match which lasted all of about a minute at most, where I thought, are these guys, they just pulled out the audience. Because the, the... what was it, the, the four-round punches or whatever it was that he was delivering, they looked so unbelievably weak. I don't know if it was Nathan <laughs> or Ray. Uh, I, you most probably know what I'm on about. It, it looked comical, you know, and and then it, it, I don't know if it was um, a homicide problem with the gringo killer or not, but that looked really uncomfortable as well, trying to get him into the position to deliver it. It was It was just looked so awkward. That was my biggest takeaway. I mean, obviously, this match was just designed, you know, for the OGs to run through them. But, yeah, that gringo killer, man, I mean, I had to pray for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so, I, I mean, you know, the match itself was irrelevant. But these two guys that they got in there, that they looked terrible. Uh, you know, they didn't look like they knew how to, to work a match. And, you know, as I said, I don't want to be overly critical because I thought overall the segment was excellent, you know, with King coming out and, and then... Um, Santana and Ortiz coming out. The only thing I didn't like, I keep saying the only thing I didn't like when all I'm doing is is just negative this week. Um, <laughs> the rest of the show was great, by the way. But I gave this criticism when we were talking about the Aces and Eight special that we did. I don't like them bringing in a hatchet. It was the same with the Aces and Eights using a hammer as a weapon. I just don't like it. And I, I just, it doesn't sit comfortably with me because it's almost like, this is the kind of crap that a, a, an eight-year-old kid who's watching Impact could say, oh, well, they're using a hatchet, you know, and if everybody at some point he's going to hit someone on the head with it. And you just know there's going to be a death down the line where an eight-year-old, you know, sticks his parent with a hatchet in, in between the eyes. And I, I don't like them when they use these, uh, these real-world weapons. Yeah, it's, you know what I compare it to when you think about when Abyss pulls out Janice. I think there's certain weapons where... I mean, at least with a chair, like, obviously, you know, you hit somebody with a chair hard enough, you could kill kill them, you know, brain damage or whatever. But 
you we all know whether it's a hatchet a hammer or in, like even with janice a club with spikes if you really hit somebody with that that's it you know there's no type of oh you know they're knocked out and you know recover like it's something that can really kill you like an instant kill so i think having the hatchet like that you know it would it, the one thing that where it gives away is a it's obviously got to be fake because you know you're not going to swing some swing a hatchet at somebody and thinking they're getting up from that and then b2 we know you're not going to attack with it because obviously you know leads back to you know what i said uh prior that you know if you were to really to hit hit somebody with one of those then you know that's the end right there so i i get what you're saying like but i mean it's wrestling so i think we're supposed to you know have an imagination when it comes to some of these things but i think with some some weapons that you know we see people use or pull out of the ring you know we we kind of know that like all right well they're either not going to hit them with it or this is super fake because you hit somebody with that that's that's it i think the problem is more to do with the fact that you know when when eight-year-old jimmy goes to his dad's toolbox there's going to be a hatchet in there janice is not going to be in there you know, so that's I think that's more of my my criticism of it. It's not the the fact that it could do some proper damage if it was used. It's just the fact that it's readily readily available. You know, it's a household item. Uh, and I think that's more of my issue with it. But anyway, um, I thought the segment overall though was quite good. And uh, yeah, uh, King is great. I really like King. Uh, I think he's, it, you know, he's really shown something. We've talked about this a lot, but he's really shown something that uh, we haven't seen in a long time. I agree. So um, the security ran down after the OGs got attacked by Santana and Ortiz. And that was, that was probably my favorite part of this segment was that they really felt like that they clobbered that security team. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it was mic'd up or if they slapped his chest at the right time to make that noise. But honestly, it, it seemed like it. they really took them out. It was good. Yeah, I know. That's, you know, it's seldom that you see... Uh... Um, faces do that you know normally you might see hills or anything like that but yeah that was a cool cool uh segment the segment afterwards was a bit confusing as well because conan was saying uh that basically it was a setup and they played into it what was the setup exactly about that segment because it seemed to me that they did get the upper hand so i don't I actually understand what was the setup about that you know, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with this feud because, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a little bit more mileage you can get out of it. But if you, you know, have them face each other again for the titles and OGs come up short, then, you know, where do you go from there? So, so it's going to be interesting to see what they do next. Mm -hmm. So then we had a plug for the Young Bucks and LAX on the Chris Jericho's Rock and Wrestling Rager at sea. That's a great name. Um yeah, no, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think we're more and more likely to see Jericho each week. And I still don't think it's going to happen, but it seems more of a reality. And it also seems like, you know, maybe there's going to be a partnership with Ring of Honor now as well and those kind of things. And at the moment, it just seems great that that um, Impact really is, well, it, it's almost like, you know, there's a, there's a gang at school and all the misfits are... are grouping together to go after it and that's what feels like is happening at the moment with impact they're the leader of this uh, kind of rebellion uh, against wwe and i think it's wonderful i think it's absolutely brilliant that finally everyone else is ganging together and saying no you're not going to monopolize this industry anymore you know i think what's where where a lot of these companies are coming to grips with is you know they're in competition with one another when really that's the competition because we see now um i i remember i just recently read an article where they were saying and i think you know it's coming to a point too where maybe someone makes a mention about it and it ends up becoming a headline but they were saying that you know they were interested in pentagon jr and phoenix and you know you sit back and you know you think like and I don't follow it exclusively. I obviously, you know, I'll watch a match here or there because I'm one of the rare few people that actually likes Roman Reigns. So anytime he wrestles, I'll watch his matches. But it seems like a lot of these companies, what they're doing, they're realizing that the E is trying to do what they did to WCW and ECW. And, you know, obviously these companies now, uh, especially when you think about WCW, no one's really kind of on that level. So, you know, they figure the way that they can, 
shut down a lot of these companies is offer the, their top guys the most money and you know they could take their top guys store them over god knows where and then that's going to cripple these companies so i think now instead of trying to be in competition with one another they say hey let's uh work together help one another out that way you know we can you know i don't want to say compete against them but you know we could still stay strong and keep continuing to do what we're doing so you know now we're seeing like you know lax versus young bucks and you know other uh crossover matches you know i still think back think back you know a little over a year ago or so i remember they said you know the idea of lucha underground working with impact was just like a no-go and then you think about we had that crossover show so it's good and i think it's good for wrestling as a whole to see these uh companies willing to work together instead of trying to compete with one another and um yeah cool right so what do we get next let me just go back to it was the gwn flashback where pt williams took on the black power ranger <laughs> uh you know me i don't watch these so i'm gonna to have to uh and i know you're, you're critical of the fact that they show whole matches and you know they, they usually show aj styles or samoa joe so what did you make of this one you know i watched this in its full entirety just because i like pd williams and i liked him during this time you know it's obviously big difference you know you're talking about over 12 13 some years ago you know, and I had always said, if you're going to show these matches, show people uh, on that are currently on the roster. I think it just, you know, go, goes a long way. Um, yeah, it was fine. I mean, I would have preferred Petey Williams to win, obviously, but I think it was kind of one of those scenarios, you know, when you have the guy from another company, big time name. I, I'm not, I know of uh, Jushin Liger, or, I don't mm -hmm. know his old name, sorry. Um, I know of him, but I'm not really too familiar of his work. But obviously, since he's a big, big name, you know, he was going to get the win. So, you know, I thought it was cool. You know, it gave people who might not be too familiar with Petey Williams' work, uh, you know, shows him when he was in his prime. I mean, he's still serviceable now, but I think he's more now kind of like a, a good hand, whereas during this time, you know, he was a top contender for the X Division Championship. Yeah, I can't add anything else to that. Amazingly enough, Joshin Liga is still wrestling. Uh, he's wrestling in the UK very shortly. Um, he must be about 90 underneath that mask. I wonder if it's the same guy. Do you think it is the same guy? You know what I wonder? If he could still pull off, because I think I've seen a clip, because he's the innovator of the, <laughs> I wanted to say it's the seven-year itch, but it's the shooting star press. I'm sorry. I, I wonder if he, could, if he can still pull that off. Hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, if anyone has seen Joshin Liga recently, let us know. Uh, does he still pull it off? There you go. All right, over to Sammy Callahan and OVE cut a promo backstage about uh, revenge against the Lucha Brothers. This this feud's great. I, I you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Sammy Callahan and and OVE are growing on me as well. I know you're you you know you're really high on them, uh, but I I think what these guys are doing is amazing at the moment. Yeah, I, I really want to see them be champions again, especially since we've seen so much growth with them now when you compare it to when they had the titles and they, you know, were, you could say, miscasted as faces. And, you know, now that they're full-blown heels, I really want to see them get another reign. And I hope it's somewhere in the cards down the road because, you know, obviously we're not going to get LAX forever. So um, I wouldn't mind them being champions and letting them run with it for a bit and then, you know, you could have Callahan, you know, still doing his stuff while they're champions. Because I think a lot of times, you know, when we think of OVE, we just think of Callahan. I mean, as of late, we've seen the Chris brothers kind of get be more involved, have matches on their own as well. So, uh, yeah, that's something I would love to see. But, yeah, this, this Callahan, once again, can't say it enough, man. It's just anything they put him in, man, it's just gold. Yeah, the... <laughs> The tag title scene at the moment is a bit strange, and we talked about this before uh, Sacrifice. And I, I just think they made a mistake putting the tag titles back on LAX at this point. They didn't need to, you know, and, and I just think that if the feud that they've got going on didn't need to be over the tag titles, it could have just been over the name, it could have been anything like that. 101 reasons why LAX and Yogis are feuding, but they didn't need to have the tag titles. And what it's done is it's kind of created a vacuum in that these guys are all kind of facing off with each other to for no real reason other than to try and maybe climb up the rankings to be challengers but you know they're not going to challenge until they 
the the OG's feud is over. So I, I just think that they could have had two tag team storylines going with with the tag belts on someone like OV or kept it on DJZ, uh, etc. I, I've got a feeling they're gone. By the way, DJZ and, and Andrew Everett. I think they. I doubt, I doubt we'll see them again because uh, I know that DJ G, DJZ was was talking. To, on an interview this week saying uh, about how Impact dropped the ball with the bromance. So but when you hear people start to criticise while they're still on the payroll, it usually means that they're they're on their way out. So, um, But it looks like we're going to get Desi Hit Squad being the ones going forward. Sorry, bro, you're going to say something. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to add a comment with it. What it did really, when you think about when they put the titles back on LAX, they really destroyed two tag teams in the works because... You think about it, if you would have kept the belts on Z and E, you know, that could have opened up maybe a feud between them and the Cult of Lee. And then, you know, you still have these other teams coming up. You know, I think during that time, you know, KM and Fala were starting to form. And then obviously Desi Hit Squad. But now, you know, with LAX, like I've always said, and there's nothing against them. I mean, they're incredible. But we know with their title reigns, they're, they run through so many people where the stuff gets stale. And I think, in a sense, they've really kind of become, um, uh, like, the, a safe haven. Like, all right, here, you know, we can always put the belts on them. And I think, you know, like you just said, you know, after they finish their program with the OGs, one's going to assume the Desi Hit Squad. And then, you know, if if they their next title change, I think the next time LAX loses the titles, they need to be kind of away from the title picture for a while. I think Mm. and like I said nothing against them they're phenomenal but you know give someone else an opportunity to run with the belts for a bit because we see every time they take a a chance with somebody it's short-lived and then you know they always go back to LAX so yeah yeah and you know my my final thing is you know I hope because I I like DJZ and uh, what Andrew Everett bring and I hate that, you know, after they lost the belts, you know, we really never seen seen them again. So if they're gone, I mean, that kind of stinks because you know, I feel like there's so much potential in that team. But, you know, we see when people come on board, I, I'm a firm believer. Every time you see somebody sign a contract, you got to know in the back of your head somebody's departing. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, to be honest with you, DJ Z and Andrew, I, I was a big fan of theirs. But at this point, with the way that the roster is, and the tag teams that we've got, I don't really see it's going to be a great loss if they went. You know, uh, don't get me wrong, they're good high flyers, but there's there's too many teams at the moment. Well, I say it's too many teams. I mean, you've got Falabar, KM, you've got a Desi Hit Squad, you've got Cult of Lee, you've got OVE, both the LAX. So there's quite a lot of, of, of matchups that you could do. Unfortunately, we're not seeing much of Cult of Lee. We're not seeing, well, KM and Falabar is losing every week. So, I just don't see where DJZ and Andrew Everett fit in, if I'm being honest, at this point. Um, so if it releases money, I don't think these guys will be on huge money. It's certainly maybe not even contracts. Uh, you know, I say, well, let that, let them go. They, they could maybe do something in the X Division, but they've done that, been there, bought the T-shirt, haven't they, really? So anyway, um, yeah, so up next was KM and Falabar versus uh, the Desi Hit Squad. And as you know, I'm not a fan of the Desi Hit Squad. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're growing on me. But not to an extent where I'm ever going to be uh, wearing a Desi Hit Squad T-shirt, put it that way. So and I'm a huge fan of KM and Falabar. And obviously this this is taking place after where last week we had KM saying to Falabar, you know, oh, we're going to have to make you meaner we have to make you angry i had to be a bad guy and uh yeah the match was was good but once again you know it's it's all about communi- miscommunication and distractions and and basically km messing up so it, what did you think of this match yeah you know they they run that too much i did think it was cool when they had the double eye poke you know that's not something that you see you know face faces do originally but uh, you know, they got to find another creative way. I mean, unless, it's, you know, they're going to try to do KM versus follow Ba again, you know, but they need, they got to find creative ways for them to lose matches. You know, it can't always be some sort of miscommunication. And I'm cool with the Desi Hit Squad, you know, new team on the scene. Um, and obviously this just gave them, you know, a win as they try to move up the ranks. Uh, like we just, you know, mentioned 
they're obviously probably going to be next in line for the tag team championships because you just look at the landscape at the moment. You know, who else can really challenge for them at this time? So, you know, it'd be nice if they kind of gave, even though I know KM and, and Follow Bar are a, a comedy team at this point, but they're really over. And I think that's something that while, you know, wins and losses are, are in this case, losses hurts uh doesn't hurt some people you know you gotta let them win sometimes to, for people to buy them in as a credible team once again it goes back to explosion doesn't it that you know you could have these guys taking on tag teams on explosion and, and winning so uh I, I really hope that at some point they do go all in on km and falavar and actually turn them into not not a non-comedy tag team so i think there's always going to be humorous elements especially they're doing things like the panda roll but at the same time you know I think these guys actually deserve something. You know, I, I think they deserve to win the titles. And I, I absolutely wouldn't mind them winning the titles. And I'd certainly prefer it over the Desi Hit Squad. Uh, yeah. So what, what do you think? Do you think these guys will ever get into a title match and, and hold it or not? Um, I think it's probably, excuse me, one of those scenarios where something has to happen and they put it on them. The thing that, I'd like to see Impact do more so is the the one art that's kind of missed sometimes where you really get a hill over is when you have a hill taking champions away from like a super baby face team. And could you imagine with a team like Fala Ba and KM where, you know, a lot of fans love Fala and you just imagine, you know, they finally get the belts and everybody's on board and then you get whether it's a Desi hit squad or some hill team just you know cheat them out of the belts that would, they would gain so much hill heat for that hill team and that's just kind of a, a miss art that we don't really see I think in wrestling as a whole where that hill you know screws over the mega baby face and get, uh, generates that super hill heat so I think mm. that's just kind of one of the things like you know they need to start taking some chances with some of these uh, wrestlers that are over like you know, put them in a situation where if you're trying to get this hill over, this hill team over, you know, you give us a reason to to buy in more. Do you, do you think that this team is working? And I'm talking about KM and Falabar now. Do you think they're working because of Falabar? Or do you think KM has a lot to do with it as well? Because I know in commentary they always talk about, you know, how people are now cheering KM, you know, and that's because it's rubbing off from Falabar. But... What, what do you think of these two individuals? Do, do you think they're both over? Do you think one of them's over and they're putting up with the other one? Or do you think, you know, one's been pulled up? I think they're both over in different ways. I mean, I think now we see KM. It's, I don't want to say so much face, but I think what got KM over before was just kind of like he came across as this obnoxious bully. And people bought into that, you know, even when you think about, you know, are you calling me a liar? Like people loved that and they bought in, bought into that. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, we'd always see him lose. And then in Fala's case, you know, everyone, you know, join, joins the, you know, patting on the head, chanting, ba, 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 you know, everyone's so into his character. But yet, once again, he's losing. So it just kind of comes across as two guys who, you know, who lose a lot. Uh, let's throw them together and they can lose together. <laughs> Do you know how I think they should package them? And to some extent, you know, the pokes in the eye kind of used, you know, went a long way towards it, but almost like in an Eddie Guerrero, you know, way that they're, they're good guys and they're super over, but they've got that sneakiness and will cheat to win. But, you know, in a, in a funny, cool way. And I think that's the way that they should package these guys because, you know, um, you know, KM, I don't think can ever be a full baby face. I think he has to have that. That, that even that element of slyness about him and i think that eddie guerrero cheat to win kind of kind of thing would, would work very well for these guys and um as you said i think they could be super over i would be amazed if they're not selling <clears throat> more merchandise than the likes of ove or or certainly the desi hit squad you know i would have thought that i, I would guess these two would be right up there in the merchandise sales believe it or not i don't know if that's crazy to suggest that but there you go that's my thoughts on it yeah, you know what? I know at least in Follow Boss, Follow Boss case. I mean, that wouldn't surprise me one bit because I think he has a kids appeal. I think you know the children children like him as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, um, let's know, listeners, what you think. Would you like to see a KM of Follow Bar, you know, push? Because at the moment they they are certainly being jobbed out each week. Although, as Road did say, you're quite right. 
the, the losses aren't really hurting them at the moment. But at some point, you've got to make them credible challengers, you know, and make them look like that they might actually win a match. So anyway, the Desi Hit Squad all win uh, after a bit of cheating and a bit of uh, of uh, miscommunication again. So then we had uh, Aries cut a promo saying he wasn't worried about his trainee opponent tonight. Aries is, is doing well here, isn't he? he? He's doing very well. Yes, I mean his this title reign with him, and I've you know I've heard some people be different about it, and that's the cool thing about you know when you hear various opinions, you know you got some people that you know on board with certain things, and some people that aren't. But uh, he's done tremendous work, and I just think you know just had me thinking like whenever they do decide to have him drop the title, you know it, it has to be to the right person. You know you can't just put it on just anybody. It has to really be the right individual because he's really doing some of his best work under you know as a heel, being the heel champion. Yeah. So uh, moving on, we had Johnny Impact doing an interview backstage. One of his better ones, I might add, uh, because they're usually awful. So <laughs> this, one, this one wasn't bad. But I quite like this whole segment where Jimmy Jacobs walked up and uh, tried to smart him off. Jimmy Jacobs is, is, is a great signing for Impact. And I'm not sure if he is working in creative backstage or not, because I, I've got a feeling he might not be, or certainly he's not one of the main driving forces. I mean, do you know anything about that? Is, is he creative or not? I think he plays a role. Um, I remember seeing on uh, when he was doing uh, Around the Ring with Josh, he actually did three segments. I want to say he had mentioned uh, some of it, if I'm not mistaken, but I do think he plays some sort of role. But what did you think of this seg segment? You know, the only thing is I like the continuity, but I just worry about because you assume that if we're getting uh, Impact versus Kong, who's going to go over? But it's like, I feel like Kong has lost some of his uh, mystique. You know, you think about he suffered two big losses to Brian Cage and Moose. So, you know, if he loses to Johnny Impact, you know, he just it comes across as this big monster that can't get the job done against, you know, the main event players, I should say. You're absolutely right. And it's a really tough situation for them to be in because, let's face it, we all know Johnny Impact's going to be winning this feud. Um well, you would assume so. Is there any way that Impact doesn't win this? You know, I think if you have Congo Kong just win, just say if they had a series of matches and you had Congo Kong win the first one, and even if you had Impact win second and third, I think that would serve better than if you have Impact win the first one. Like, because it just, it just seems now, you know, you think about when uh, we had the pairing, the initial pairing of Jimmy Jacobs and Kong, you know, we were seeing them every week and, you know, it really gave Kong something like this mystique. And then, you know, you look back now and, uh, you know, I thought his match with Moose and then as well, most recently with Brian Cage, there was some stellar work on his end. But, you know, it just, once again, what we talk about, a, a lot of the, a lot of these, uh, when you're having some of these matches, can I buy into the fact that the opponent has a, gr a good chance of uh, pulling up the upset? And, you know, you never want to walk into something just figuring like, okay, we already know how this is going to go or it's going to be predictable. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm interested to see. I, I think Kong o Kong needs to win, but obviously it just seems like they want to integrate Johnny Impact back into the world title picture. So for, for them to do that, he obviously would need to overcome Kong o Kong. Yeah, one one thing that I'm disappointed that it never kind of carried on with is uh, Chandler Park storyline because uh, obviously Chandler Park got destroyed by Congo Kong, and we haven't heard from him since. So, do, do we know is Chandler Park still with him? I think I think he was just a one off. What they did was they did you know they had him just come in, work a couple tapings, and then that was their way of writing him off because. Ever since then, I've seen no mention of him. Um, you know, I'll see people who uh, tweet. Uh, I think the wrestler's uh, Ethan Page. And there's no type of mention of Impact or anything. So I think it was just a one-off. Yeah, I'm just looking. It does say that uh, that he's still with Impact on Wikipedia or Wikipedia. So then again, that doesn't really mean anything. Um, yeah, so uh, it was strange because they, they, they did really... Um, kind of push it didn't they with, with Ethan Park sorry Chandler Page that uh, he was 
they did a lot of vignettes with him. They did all this, the same storyline that they've done with Joseph Park, where it's a guy who can't wrestle and he's coming in. And then it just got dropped straight away. So it's a strange one. I, I know that he had a baby in real life, not not him, obviously his partner did. So I just wonder if he's he's still wrestling. Maybe he's not. Who knows? If any of our listeners know, let us know, because, uh, you know, I, I can't find out anything else about it. Right. OK, so next up, I believe, was the title match. And you you know that uh, the guy was never going to be winning this Uh not Dustin Diamond. I want to say, <laughs> what's his name? Um, not Dustin Diamond. What was the guy's name? Dustin Cameron. <laughs> Sorry. Dustin Cameron was never winning this. But you also know that when they don't put it on as the main event, <laughs> you know he's got no chance. Uh, and they kind of spoiled it with this. But um, yeah, what I liked about this was the way that Aries felt that he was such a small, not opponent, but what I'm looking for, small threat that he didn't even bother getting into his ring gear. He just came down in his street clothes uh, to wrestle him. And I love little touches, attention to detail like that. I think it, it really does make it. You know, what's so cool about him is, you know, when you if you're somebody who didn't maybe not follow the product, and you, know, you see Austin Aries and you think, oh, he's this small guy, what can he do? But even though he might be small in stature, he wrestles big. And what I mean by that, not saying that he does power moves, but just how he delivers certain things, you know, you don't, you're not accustomed to seeing someone of that size um, wrestle in, in. I don't know if you get, get where what I'm saying, but just the way that he delivers his stuff, and and I thought it was just cool seeing him in his street clothes. Like you know, you already knew where there was this there this was going, and he just destroyed this guy, and where they had to end up throwing in the towel. But he wrestles so much bigger than what he is, and I think that's what makes him a believable world champion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, the other thing is, you know, I've talked about how the wrestling looks as well. And, you know, certainly I've been negative about Johnny Impact, you know, making it look like it doesn't hurt. And we've talked about Ishimori and Brian Cage making their moves look impactful. But Austin Aries is another one. As you say, he's small. But when he delivers that brain buster, it looks like that's a, you know, that's a bloody th- awful thing to take in real life so you know fair play to him you know he's a small guy but he's super strong what did you think of the um well we'll, we'll come to the after the match in a second but i did like the way that uh there was a towel thrown in i quite like that we haven't seen that in wrestling in a long time so i, I do like that they're trying different things and and, and they're building this story with anthony corelli do, do you think this is going to lead to a match between the two of them um, I think it would all depend on his health status because I know, you know, we had talked about this uh, last week, how he, he has some type of uh, career ending injury. So I think he can't compete. I would have loved to see Austin Aries after because after, well, the, you know, they end up going with the low blow. But say if Corelli would have slapped Austin Aries, I would have loved Austin Aries to like give him that, that roaring elbow or do something to attack him. But once again, given that his uh condition where if he can't compete then you know obviously you don't want to put him in harm's risk so yeah it would all depend depend on his health i mean if he can he take a bump i mean you know you're talking about what what was it It was something with his neck right then yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, so you know that's not something to mess around with so i mean if he can he can the one thing i will say i felt he should uh austin aries didn't do enough for them to throw the towel in I would have loved to see him kind of beat down on the guy more before he threw the talent. I felt like he kind of just threw it in it a little bit too early. But, yeah, that's something that we don't see a lot in wrestling now, where it's just instead of, you know, a give up or, you know, I know one creative way, <clears throat> excuse me, when they're talking about submissions, you know, you see a pass out a lot. But to throw in the towel, that means something. I think at some point, Corelli's going in the last chancery, because obviously if he has got a bad neck, which he's referred to, then that's going to be the move that, you know, is going to draw heat, isn't it? One thing that was surprising as well, when the two of them were stood next to each other, is that Corelli's bigger than Austin Aries, going back to the small guy thing. And Corelli was always seen as a small wrestler in WWE, wasn't he? As Santino. He was always seen as the comedy small guy. So, but he was bigger than Austin Aries. There you go. After the match, we had Eddie Edwards come down again and... Uh, Hit him with a kendo stick. And, uh, yeah, this this storyline is now built up and he's getting a match next week by the looks of it. He just looks awkward when he puts the uh, kendo stick in his mouth. It's just something about it. It just <laughs> looks weird on my end. 
Well, there's something I think looks weird about Eddie Edwards all the time anyway. And I think it was, uh, I think it might have been BQ who mentioned it, that he doesn't think he's got any teeth on, on the top row. <laughs> you know what? I, I forgot where I seen him, but I, I it was one show where he, I, he had, it was some type of mannerism where he's seen, I mean, he does have teeth, but it was so funny because I forgot when it was discussed, but I was like, all right, the next Eddie Edwards match, I'm going to look. I'm like, I'm going to see if he has teeth. And uh, yeah, he he has teeth. He has them, does he? <laughs> anyway, leading on from this, we went backstage with Alicia and she was uh, saying that she was going to be concentrating on the knockouts title, which I, I find hilarious. Uh, bearing in mind, she hasn't wrestled in over a year. Uh, but yeah, apparently she, she wants to go after the knockouts title. So um, yeah, Eddie Edwards came in said everything's about to change because he'll be world champion next uh, after he beats, uh, you know, Aries. And she, she walked off saying she can't even deal with him right now. So do you think that they're going to go down a domestic abuse angle? Do you think she's going to cost them the match? Do you think she's going to be involved in this? Uh, none. None of the above. I think what they might, the one thing I can see them might do, because she has competed on an explosion. I mean, I know that probably doesn't count. But I think what they'll do is they're gonna separate them because you think you think about it, her whole tenure and impact is just Eddie's wife. Eddie's wife, you know, her, her most claim to fame was the match that she had. Uh, I, I don't, I want to say it was a last slam anniversary where it was her and uh, you know obviously Eddie versus Davy Richards and Angelina Love, which you know she did a phenomenal job in that. So I think maybe this is just an opportunity to actually thrust her in the knockouts division and have her compete. Uh, it was last year's anniversary. Uh, I do remember that because I was there for that one. But uh, yeah, um, and she's tidy, isn't she? I mean, I've met her in real life as well. So I met her at the uh, the pre-show thing uh, where they do the signings and she is absolutely tiny, even compared to Alicia at out. She, she's small. So uh, yeah. Uh, and talking of uh, Alicia at out being a five, we had Miss Bordeaux up next. She... Uh, I was disappointed that none of our listeners were female last week and they didn't leave any comments on this. But um, she, she's, yeah, she's super hot, isn't she? Yes, and not only that, I'm going to say this, and I'll get on the other one later. She's a star in the making for Impact. I just think if it's going to go the way that I think, just how, you know, they're having her come out every week and, you know, obviously we haven't seen her compete yet, and maybe they're going to build up towards that, which will, you know, is excellent. But just with the presentation and then her mic work, I think she's a star in the making for Impact if they go about it the right way. Just take their time; they're not in no rush. They have a a, a star in the making in Scarlet Bordeaux. And where did uh, Bobo come from? I mean, <laughs> this is the first time we've seen him, and he seems like a, a terribly happy comedy actor to do the interview but where, where did they explain who he was uh no he's just a random random guy i mean i think what it was all what is all meant to do is you get some random dude who's so enamored by her beauty you know he was uh, tripping all over his words but her deliverance just you know i i mean as much as we can gush about how beautiful she is and she is which she is but her mic work in the, just the presentation of everything that's what really just I'm taking it back like wow like they really got something good on their hands you know just you know take their time you know they don't have to just thrust her into the mix of things right now they take their time with her she can be a major uh, star for years to come in impact absolutely um, but yeah I quite, I quite enjoyed this this segment and I did say last week that although she's obviously very attractive and has got curves in the right place I just find her delivery of it really awkward and uh you know once again there was bits of this where it was quite awkward it's like she's trying to be sexy but isn't and but, although she is i know that sounds weird it sounds like an, the plot of inception or something you know you've got to go deeper but yeah um once again she 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 knocked it out of the park this week and I, i'm interested to see where, where they go with this now this is getting a bit off track here bro because you usually bore up to date on these things but how many more weeks have we got of these tapings do you know no, we're getting a new set. Um, the moment that this probably releases, so th by the time the next impact comes, that's going to be a new set of tapings. Because I want to say I don't know and how long it's running, but I know once they did the Canada tapings, they were only going to do uh, it's going to be like two two weeks worth, so two episodes worth. So I know we're going to get on the twelfth and is it twelfth and the thirteenth? They're doing I think they're doing some tapings. So uh, yeah, we're, we'll we'll begin a new set. 
so basically we, we got one more episode of we uh of the of these tapings and then onto the new stuff is that right yeah uh, if i'm not mistaken i want to say um the 12th and the 13th okay, so yeah great. yeah I, I think we got one last set and then we're getting a new one um but i'm i'm not too sure I've got to say, it's great that they've gone back to this model, you know, because the spoilers do harm the, the, the product, you know, and taping so much in advance. And I know reading spoilers, you don't really know how they're going to slot it together and those kind of things, you know, especially with things like Killer Cross, etc. You don't know how it's going to be slotted together. Um, but even so, it brings back that air of... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That air of... Um, mystery you know you don't know what's going to happen and that's the problem that you know eddie edwards i, I don't i'm guessing that's been taped already but if that would have been on the first show of the next set of tapings you wouldn't actually know if he's going to win or not having said that i don't know if he wins or not yeah i think though with the spoilers you know with, with a lot of spoilers you know people look and i mean at the end of the day because I'm, I'm guilty of it you know sometimes i'll look because i want to see what happens I think, you know, the one thing you think about what well, we haven't had as of late, you know, we haven't really had no big title changes on uh, Impact. I think, you know, the most the, the most recent one was obviously with LAX uh, regaining the tag team titles. But I think that's always kind of a big, you know, oh, snaps, you know, the, the title change. So, you know, I'm assuming that in a couple of weeks we'll probably get one of those special pay-per-view like shows and, you know, maybe we see a title change. But that's one thing that I, I kind of miss, you know, when you get the big title change on TV. Yeah, um, as I said, I don't know if that happens uh, next week, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see. So anyway, let's moving on because we are running quite long on this show tonight. Um, yeah, so Grado, Katarina, Joe Hendry and uh, confronted Eli Drake about the gift last week and those kind of things. Obviously, we, we can all see where this storyline is going, but someone did actually uh, mention a, another swerve that could happen in this, and I thought it was quite an interesting booking idea. And once again, we're getting to fantasy booking. This has nothing to do with uh, spoilers or anything like that, but someone suggested that uh, that Katarina might turn on both of them and side up with Eli Drake. Do you think that's a possibility? You talked about a, a valet. That would be a curveball because, I mean, right now it looks predictable where it's headed. But I think if they did that, that would be a, a, a creative idea right there. Instead of giving us what we're going to we assume, you know, you give us something out of left field. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I, I quite liked how uh, Eli Drake just said, you know, he can win with whoever he wants. And, and he grabbed Conley and Lee and said he doesn't care whose partner is out of a match. Uh, you know, these three guys, well, actually all of these guys involved in this program, I really like, and I know that Grado gets his detractors uh, because, you know, he, he's, he is a comedy character, but at the same time, I think he does really good work, you know, and he, and he does exactly what he's needed to do. Sometimes he goes a bit OTT, but let's face it, most of the storylines he's been involved with have been quite good and quite fun. Anyway, so the match took place, uh, Grado, Joe Hendry versus Eli and Caleb. Any thoughts on this? Um, it was actually Trevor Lee, but uh, I mean, at least Eli got the win. So, I mean, it makes up for the loss that he had from Joe Hendry. And I mean, I know, I, uh, I guess during that time he wasn't under contract, but Eli gets the win and hopefully Eli, assuming that, you know, what you speculated didn't happen, hopefully Eli's moving on to bigger and better things. Yeah, absolutely. We won't dwell on it, uh, but let's move on. Desi Hit Squad were happy about their win against until Gamma Singh walked in and started beating them again. Oh, oh dear, dear, dear. This just, it always drains the energy out of me when I see Gamma Singh. It's a shame because, you know, I want the Desi hits got to be successful, but oh, I don't know, it's this guy. I was reading the other day that apparently he's the uncle of, um, what's his name? The guy on Jinder Mahal. Yeah, I didn't know that. There you go. Yeah, you know what? It just, I, I think it's going to get old real quick, you know, the him kind of berating them because you see something like that. You're trying to get these guys over as heels, but, you know, people are going to sympathize with that. You know, they're working hard, trying to move up the ranks, and instead of being applauded, you know, they're being abused. So that that's something I think can get old real quick. It was funny when he, when he came back and gave him another slap each. <laughs> it didn't make me laugh when I shouldn't, but there you go. All right, so Matt Seidel did, then did a promo about losing the X Division title. And uh, Matt Seidel's been great. I, I really like him, and I just worry what they do with him now. 
because obviously he's had his two rematches. Well, he's had his rematch. I just wonder what they're going to do now. Where, where do you think they'll go with someone like Seidel? Well, before I answer that, I loved this because I feel like in a way what he what they were able to do, it seems like they're moving him from the X division. And I think, you know, when I was talking about earlier about maybe the company trying to get a core of six or seven guys, maybe Seidel can be one of those guys. And I can see them slowly but surely trying to move him into the main event picture you know with this character i don't think he's going to get lost in the shuffle because i think the work that he's done where we you know you think about where this character started with the whole spiritual advisor and then to where we've gotten to now i think big things are, are going to come for him we just gotta just kind of have to wait because you know right now he's just kind of soaking in the fact that you know he's no longer x division champion so he's going to, you know, find a new direction. And I think he's going to end up uh, competing in the main event picture, title picture. Do you, do you know what? You know, obviously, Eddie's up next against uh, Austin Aries. And, uh, you know, I don't know if he's going to win or not. You know, that we've talked about how it could go down the Sammy Callahan route, those kind of things. But I, I would actually quite like to see a, a Seidel Aries program. And because the guys are both small, I think it'd actually be a really good match i think you know it could still you know match of the year kind of contender thing because both of these guys could wrestle and um yeah i i would i would love to see that again i should add because we've had it already but i'd like to see it again uh, you know thoughts on that or no i i think that would work i mean even if you wanted to run it you know both of them being hills i you know i think we see an impact where you know even though you got guys who compete in x division I mean, some guys are more than capable of handling their own in the main event scene. And I just think with his character and what he's been able to do thus far, I think it's time to move him up. And I think that's something we'll see. It might be a slow build towards it, but um, I, I can see that heading towards that way. Yeah. So anyway, let's move on <clears throat> to the main event for the night. OV versus the Lucha Brothers. Uh, is that their official tag team name, by the way? I want to say they just probably just dubbed them that because they're real life brothers. I don't think that's the real name though. Yeah. So anyway, this this what an amazing main event, wasn't it? Yes, but the one the one thing I will say is, and you know, it's something that you normally don't see coming from a hillside, but. You wonder if OVE is ever going to get their comeuppance. I know the story being played is, you know, they have their chances, but they obviously rely so much on trying to unmask uh, both Pentagon and Phoenix. But, I mean, these guys have really been dominating OVE, <laughs> you know, this whole this whole time. So, you know, as they continue this feud, you know, you like to see some sort of comeuppance. And I, like I said, I know that's crazy talking from the hill side of things. But, you know, I was watching this match and, you know, as much as I loved it, I'm thinking, you know, is OV going to even, you know, some cheap, dirty win, you know, a low blow and foot on the ropes or anything of that. But, you know, we and we, we talk about this with some people, wins and losses. There's some where you can lose, you know, some people can lose a lot and it doesn't affect them. But for a team like OVE, you know, they need some of the, some some of these wins, you know, for for them to have some sort of momentum in, you know, a feud like this. So. That was just my thing. I, I'm just watching uh, on the results that I read. They have gifts of some of some of the moves in the match, and I'm just watching the opening where uh, Phoenix you know gets thrown over by Pentagon into the, to start off the match and does like a double drop kick. That's a sweet move. That was impressive. Um, anyway, sorry I got sidetracked there. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's going to be strange, you know, how they go with this because. Whatever things like masks are involved, you just know that it's not going to happen and, you know, that the good guys are going to win. But, yeah, I, I just wish that, uh, you know, OV would look stronger. And I know the, the wins and losses don't really matter, but I just wish that they would look stronger at times because they, I can't remember the last time OV won a match. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I know we talk about this from time to time, but it's just once again, it's just, you know, you want to be able to walk into a match just thinking like, hey, this can go either way. You know, when you got somebody who's uh, uh, somebody who loses on the regular, you know, it makes the outcome predictable. And like I said, you know, me, obviously, I have a, I have a personal interest in OVE. You know, I like them. So obviously I want to see them win. 
But, you know, when you're having a feud, and, and I know sometimes some people are against it, they don't like the 50-50 booking, but, you know, the one the best feuds are the ones where it's kind of, you know, you kind of exchange some wins from time to time, even though it could be a, a scenario where, you know, they have a best of five and maybe, you know, one, you know, group or wrestler, you know, they win three and, you know, the other one's two or whatever the case may be, but you make it honest. So that, that's just, that was just my thing. But with that said, great main event. I mean, Pentagon Jr., and I can't stress it enough, it's just so crazy that you think they've done a better job with him now that he doesn't have the title, and you wonder why Clint weren't they able to do this when he was cha uh, world champion. Mm. One thing I did love in this, which is something I've never seen in my, what was it, 30 plus years of watching wrestling, is tying two Lucha masks together. <laughs> I, th I thought that was a great spot. And Sammy Callahan, you know, once again, on the outside of the ring is, is great, isn't he? Uh, you know, he really does hype up the crowd. But, I mean, there were some fantastic moves all the way through this match, you know, stuff that, you know, as I said, a 30-plus year wrestling fan that I've, I've never seen, you know, like the bit... I, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but there was, there was this one move where Phoenix... Oh, sorry, Pentagon was in the middle of the ring and, and Phoenix kind of jumped up on top of him and then rolled back down to slingshot pentagon into the corner i don't know if you remember it i don't i don't know i mean they do it's, so much quite hard to, stuff yeah. yeah it's hard to describe but yeah it, it was like he, he slingshot pentagon into the into like a cannonball into the corner but i mean some of the stuff in this match was great and to be fair to ov they got in some really cool stuff as well i like the double um suicide dives that, that was very good you know the the spike pile driver by jumping off the rope it was all very good and lots of near pins and those kind of things fantastic stuff um and to some extent at this point you just wonder if sammy callahan needs to be involved in this feud you kind of could this this could have easily been for the tag titles you know and i know the pentagon jr is a individual star in his own right but i mean this could have been a tag title match couldn't it you know fighting over feuding over the belts and it's something that you know we'd all enjoy watching yeah that's why you know we talk about it you know with you know certain individual uh, title holders you know sometimes you know you mix it up it opens a whole bunch of different possibilities i mean you know you could easily talk about well why don't they have lax uh feud with pentagon and phoenix or face one another i should say but you know maybe they don't want to do the face versus face or whatever the case may be but that's you know that's the thing you know to freshen things up give us fresh matchups and yeah could you imagine if this was for the tag team titles i i mean it would rock you know so i mean this was a, a pay-per-view quality match was that so um my taping cut out at this point, so I didn't actually see the post-match. I believe there was a Killer Cross segment. Yes, and this is the other thing I wanted to get on. He's another one that I think what they're doing with him, where, you know, they just have these, uh, you know, this was a backstage segment where he had laid out Anthony Corelli and he had dropped his signature card. He's another one. That's a star in the making. The, what they're doing with him, taking their time, you know, where... You know, sometimes you know, he has uh, matches. I know he's only had a few up until this point. But, you know, we get these uh, packages of what he's done so far, these uh, segments. You know, the route that they're going with him, he's going to be a, another star for Impact. So um, I'm really looking forward to see, you know, how he's built and, you know, how far he goes. Do you know what's really cool about him as well? I, I've been talking to him this week via email. Um, I, I haven't told anyone this. No, I've been trying to line up an interview, and he comes over as such a nice guy in real life. Um, the other thing as well is that uh, he's really protective of his character in the respect that, um, you know, we were talking about doing an interview, and he said, oh, I'd rather keep it as audio as it keeps my mystique about me a bit more, which I thought that was pretty cool as well. You know, so uh, this guy's going to go places. And, and the great thing about him is that, He's not an ex WWE star. He's almost someone who's, who's flown under the radar, but at the same time, is super cool. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Anyway, so you usually do a rundown of next week's show. What we got for us? Yes, um, and I, give me your th uh, thoughts on this because while it looks good, I mean, some of the stuff is kind of random, but it looks like we're gonna get Matt Seidel versus Pentagon Junior. We're getting the Desi Hit Squad facing Petey Williams and Taji Ishimori. And then we're going to get Alicia facing Tessa Blanchard. Does anything I, 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 what I just listed kind of come across as random <laughs> to you? 
<laughs> all of it, except for the Ishimori Peter Williams one, because obviously they attacked them last week. But um, yeah, it, it does, as you say, seem random. Uh, Alicia versus Tessa. I was going to say, well, welcome back to the knockouts, Alicia. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good. You know, maybe that will play into the storyline, you know, that Eddie will say you're wasting your time. I don't know. Um, yeah, but the first one, though, Pentagon versus Matt Seidel. That's, that's a bit weird. I, I, by the way, I think that will be the best match of the lot. Uh, but it is it is just thrown together, isn't it? No real storyline behind it. Yeah, you know, I think the least random one to me would be the Tessa Alicia one because, you know, obviously Tessa's on a roll now. So, and then Alicia, Alicia's trying to, you know, get back into the knockouts division. So, I mean, to have Tessa run through her, I guess, you know, that's fine. I think the Petey Williams and Taji Ishimori versus Desi Hit Squad, only because you would think, and I, I know I'm, I always try to remind myself, not everything's going to be, you know, textbook, but wouldn't it have made more sense for them to face the Desi Hit Squad this episode versus two, two weeks, two weeks after you, after the attack, and obviously the Pentagon, the Pentagon Junior and Matt Seidel match, I mean, while you know, it's interesting. I mean, I guess you could say that's what ties into maybe the promo that Matt Seidel gave. But, you know, you think that there's still uh, Pentagon Jr. still has his feud with uh, OVE. So, but overall, I think it's a solid card. I think everything's going to be fantastic. So I can't wait. Just going back to the Desi Hitscott thing. You're absolutely right. There's no reason why the two matches couldn't be switched around you know, and have KM and Falabar face them next week. You know, because it's all taped out of sequence, so seems a strange, strange um, uh, way of booking it. But there you go. Never mind. Um, yeah. So that, that's this week's show. Thanks for the, the rundown there. Just to remind you of the trivia question uh, before we move on. You know, Rebels been back on our television screens, uh, but she debuted in a stable which featured a masked wrestler who was under the mask and what was the name of the stable. So leave your comments below. Hey, leave don't forget to leave for a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. The Check out the video below this for more show. Impact Wrestling and don't related content. don't forget to hit subscribe and this give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. We really don't care. All feedback is good feedback, as I always say. Anything to finish on, bro? Uh, that's all on my end. Right. Take care, folks. Have a good week and we'll catch you.